Very good evening. Welcome to uh, the Marlow Climate Action Hustings for the Buckinghamshire County, uh, sorry, for the Buckinghamshire Council elections. Um, it's my, my great pleasure to be the host tonight on behalf of the Marlow Climate Action Network. Um, so what I want to do is just give a very brief introduction um, to the Marlow Climate Action Network and why, why we've wanted to organise this event tonight. So um, the Marlow, um, Marlow Can, as it's known, is a group of people and organisations all based in or, or very close to Marlow and really actively trying to improve Marlow's response to climate change. Um, so started with a group of about 50, um, 50 sort of representatives from different groups, all, all with their own particular purpose, um, whether it be focused on, on litter clearing and, and sort of plastic waste or focused primarily around carbon reduction or other loads of other community-based projects. Um, so um, I've been, it's, it's been a privilege to be in, involved in that group and to hear some of the great work that's going on. I think Marlow is really, really well placed as, as a community to, to lead the way in this front. So, uh, and I think uh, it's, it's just such an important opportunity to, to uh, in terms of the, the part we all play. Um, we can all, in terms of our, our ability to vote, both, both at a national level, but of course also at a local level. And the, the, the importance of that in terms of the impact that we can have. So that was the chart, really, what we wanted to do, have, a, have an opportunity tonight to, to provide uh, a platform to ask questions for some of the candidates for the upcoming election. Um, in terms of just to, just to give you a very brief um, background, the reason this is this particularly resonates for me, I um, as again uh, uh, one of the one of the people involved in the Marlow Climate Action Network, um, I, I got involved in in environmental work uh, and I think that was, for me that was triggered um, as uh, when, I, when I became a father a few years ago and I think it really got me thinking about our, our, our future generations and and I guess our responsibility to them so this is this is really really important to me really close to, to my heart and something that I'm really looking forward to having the chance to discuss um, because I think um, as I said we've all got a role to play in in being um, in understanding um, the the, the positioning of, of all our, our local candidates. So that's kind of my introduction, just as a, a few housekeeping points. Once we get underway, um, we're, we're very privileged to have David Downing with us tonight, who's going to who's going to be facilitating the conversation. Um, so once we once we get into into that process, um, we do already have some some questions that we've received ahead of time, which he will which David will be asking um, 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 as, 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 as some of the questions. But if you've got other ones, other questions that you'd like to ask throughout the event, please use the Q&A function. Of course, we do have the chat function as well, which is great for commentary, and please do use it. But if you've got questions, it's, it'd be much, much more easy, much, much easier to, to keep track um, if we can use um, the, the Q&A function. So please do that. And actually, and, and if you can do that earlier on in the event, before we actually start the questioning, it'll make David's life a lot easier in terms of planning the order and planning the time. So, so yeah, please do use the Q&A function, um, get your questions in early, and, and that will make things a lot easier for us. Um, other housekeeping um, points, we've got uh, a slot until 9.30 um, tonight, but we'll, we'll go on as long as, as long as it's sort of appropriate based upon um, the questions that are coming in and, and, and how much time we seem to need. Um, so that's, that's about it from, from me as, as an intro. As I said, thank you very much all for being here. Um, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to run through the candidates we've got here with us. And in fact, I'm very glad to see that Neil Marshall's just joined us. Uh, I know that he had a, a slight delay just getting here. So I'm really pleased to see that, that Neil's here now. So what I'll do now is say that we have uh, our five candidates with us tonight, um, which we're delighted to have. So we've got Anna Crabtree from the Liberal Democrat Party. We've got Mark Hartley from the Green Party. Um, we've got Neil Marshall, who's just with us now from the Conservative Party. Uh, Mark Scholes from as an independent for Independence for Marlow, and Fanula Woods from the Labour Party. So what I'm going to do now is just ask them to um, individually introduce themselves. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe have about a minute to go through an introduction for yourself, and um, and followed by approximately two minutes to give a bit of an opening statement um, prior to to starting the, the actual facilitated questioning. Um, so I'll just go through in, in no particular order, the order that I just um, introduced you there, or I'll invite Anna to, 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 to kick things off. Thank you very much, Dan. And thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity to be here today. 
My name's Anna Crabtree and I'm one of the Lib Dem candidates for Marlowe. Um, and before I start rattling through Lib Dem manifesto things about more trees and more electric vehicle charging points, which I know we all want, um, just a comment on my personal commitment to the cause. Dan's already mentioned future generations and it comes up a lot and it's often discussed. Um, but for me, it's a real and immediate concept. When my daughter came home from school, visibly upset because she'd watched a David Attenborough film about polar bears, that night she would not go to bed and she lay crying hysterically for what felt like hours. Two points really came out of that for me. The first was that I don't think it's an irrational reaction. Um, we should be scared. And, you know, it's only children who sometimes reflect these things back to us. And the second point was that as a parent, I did what I felt I had to do, which was to promise I would do what I could to make it okay. So that's the reason that I feel that we need to declare a climate emergency. We need to have a net zero target of 2030. And we need to change the whole structure of council decision making, I believe, because every department needs to consider its environmental impact of the decisions it's making. It cannot be something that is relegated to one particular area that one person has responsibility for. It needs to be spread throughout every department, whether that's procurement or housing or transport or education. I think we need to take it seriously and we need to make sure that every aspect of council business is considering the environment. The Lib Dems would like to introduce a cabinet level position which encourages this to happen faster um, so not one person who is just the only person responsible for environment but one person who reminds everybody else in charge of every other department that they need to be taking it seriously we would like to make plenty of changes regarding improving recycling levels decarbonizing investments of things like pension investments so that we're not making money from investing in fossil fuels We'd like to introduce a low emission zone in Marlow, and we would also like to do things like reducing fly tipping by stopping charging for people disposing of waste at tips. I think that's all that I'll cover for now, but I look forward to answering more questions later. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Anna. And um, on to Mark Hartley from the Green Party, please. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join you tonight. Uh, my name is Mark Hartley. I'm representing the Green Party, uh, along with Lizzie Owen and Aidan Carlyle um, for the Marlow. Um, I've lived in Marlow for 18 years, uh, run a business with my business partner, Joe, for 15 years, Jam Theatre. We have hundreds of part-time, full-time students. We've worked with community and schools, um, and we obviously produced professional theatre before um, the pandemic. Six, six years ago now, I think it is, I fell into having to teach GCSE science to our younger full-time students. These are full-time students that have come out of big schools because highly intelligent, um, but amazingly gifted kids. But uh, a bit like um, Anna just mentioned, um, I had the task of trying to explain to them the biology and the chemistry and of what we've done um, to our world. And it was a tough pill to give to them because their questioning made me question myself. And that's why we need to do something about it. So the Greens, uh, along with our social agenda, our care for people um, and our society and wanting to uh, stop uh, social care cuts and uh, obviously help mental health support in this county, we want to protect our environment and it's crucial and our whole party is built around that. Um, we need to protect what we have. We need to protect our green belt, our woodlands, our waterways, our air for our future. So that's the principally what we want to uh, decision making need to be around. Um, the pandemic itself, which I'm sure will be one of our questions at some point, has been so difficult for all of us. But we also see this as an amazing opportunity to come out of this pandemic um, and create real lasting change and build a greener future. Um, we've proven that we can change habits, we've proven if the desire is there, if the education is there, if the information is there out there for the public, that we can do something about it. Our young people know all of this, they're taught it in school, they're coming home and they should, the, the adults need to start listening. 
Uh, we need to, uh, like Anne has just said, we need to declare a climate emergency immediately. I do not understand uh, if the Conservative Party are, or the current council, council are passionate about this, why they haven't. Uh, declaring this will ensure that we put every decision that, that this comes at the forefront of every single decision that we make. Um, we believe that we should be leading the way and not uh, letting other councils around us um, show us up in many ways. Uh, it seems for me that there's a lack of ambition and a lack of uh, urgency in what the decision making we, we're doing. Um, I would love to see a rainbow colour of representation in the council. I am obviously here to represent the Green Party but we would love um, to work with anybody uh, to put climate change at the top of the agenda um, for the next four years. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. And um, on to, to Neil Marshall from the Conservative Party, please. Well, thank you. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Neil Marshall, uh, the Conservative Party candidate, uh, a retired airline pilot, which you might find a bit... Uh, controversial and also engineering manager. I have lived in Marlow for over 45 years, been a councillor for over 20 years and held positions as uh, town mayor. I've been cabinet member on economic development with Wickham and I was cabinet member for planning at Wickham. Or I've chaired the town council planning, transport and environment committee for many years. I also served as Chair of Governors on a local school for 10 years. Currently a member of the Economic Growth and Housing Scrutiny Committee on the Bucks Unity. I'm also a member of the Planning Committee for West, uh, the West, Southwest area and I'm also a Licensing Committee member. I completely accept that Marlow can and should lead by example in action on mitigating climate change. The Town Council is one of the first councils to have completed its own carbon audit and has also engaged uh, professional support to guide the way forward. However, the Town Council's carbon footprint equates to around about three domestic properties. So we as individuals can have a much greater impact on Marlow's carbon footprint. So set an example, measure our own carbon footprint and see what we can all achieve collectively. Turning specifically to our unitary strategy, the climate change strategy adopted by, adopted by the new council is ambitious, is deliverable and is fully costed and budgeted for. This contrasts sharply with many of the other parties and their policies that we hear from tonight who have the luxury of being able to advocate virtually anything at any cost from the position of being in opposition. Unlike Labour and Lib Dem councils, which passed grandstanding motions and then failed to deliver, the Conservatives have an agreed, ambitious and deliverable and costed strategy to play our part in reducing global warming. We will be net carbon zero by 2050 and potentially much earlier aiming for 75% reduction by 2030. That was the latest from the Bucks Council, but you may have heard Boris commit to 78% by 2035, just recently. Bucks Conservatives have already led by reducing carbon emissions from our council buildings and activities with falls of over 50%. However, we have plans to do more. We have carried out the carbon audit, committed at least an extra 5 million towards reducing or offsetting carbon emissions and improving air quality. This will match fund at least the same again from other sources. Other council budgets will also contribute to agreed implementations. And there are over 60 actions planned to achieve this. Great, thank you. Thank you, Neil. And next on to Mark Scholes from the um, Independence of Marlow. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for inviting me um, tonight. 
Working conjunction then. Um, I've lived in Marlow for the majority of my life, uh, attending Little Marlow Primary and Great Marlow Secondary Schools. I've run my own business in Marlow for the last uh, 15 years. I have a, a clinic, a physio clinic in Marlow High Street um, for the last five years. And I'm an active member of the Marlow Chamber of Trade and Marlow Society. Uh, my engagement in politics really only materialised after the birth of, of my daughters as a seminal moment, I think, of a lot of us, is uh, when children are born, really thinking about their future and what their future is going to be like um, in, over the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, it's made me very interested in how the workings of civil society affects their health and well-being. Uh, and I'm standing for the election to help make our town and, and help Bucks as well uh, better for, for future generations. Uh, I'm uh, currently a vice chairman of governors at, uh, and trustee at Sandygate School. Um, and also for the last two years, I've sat on the Bucks County Council uh, Education Select Committee as a co-opted primary school parent governor representative. So that's uh, trying to hold the director of children's services uh, to account for the for education and uh, children's social care. Um, one of my pledges is to help build a town community that's fit for the 21st century. I think the times have changed and um, fresh perspectives are needed. I um, not really been very impressed with what I've seen from the uh, Conservative Party. They've had not had enough scrutiny uh, or opposition in the last, well, I've been involved for that last, deeply involved for the last five years, and uh, I think they need more. So I believe that's why I'm standing primarily as an independent. I'm never going to run the council but I will be holding whoever is running the council to account um, for the benefit of the town and not, not, not for uh, any other reason. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, uh, on to Fanola Woods from the Labour Party, please. And uh, Thanks, David, for facilitating this tonight and hello to everybody. Um, I'm Fanola Woods. I'm standing for as your Labour candidate in Marlow. Um, I live and work in Marlow as a solicitor and I have a background in the legal profession plus social housing, which is one of my passions and is one of our 12 point plan to create sustainable, healthy and environmentally effective housing for people. So that's one. Um, I'm from Northern Ireland, but I've been in England for 21 years now, quite a long time. Um, so yes, so we do have a 12 point plan. I won't rattle through them all now. It might just be better just to pick up in questions later on. But a lot of our policies revolves around trying to pick up on how we've lived over the past 12 months, trying to galvanise and not go back to how we lived before. So trying to utilise more public transport, make public transport better in Morrow. Um, you don't necessarily have to send your child to a school quite far away. If you could send your child to a local school um, and walk them to school, you know, that might, you know, benefit it. Um, so, yeah, and I think, I mean, I think we're all here because we passionately care about the environment and I think, you know, it's a, I think John Kerry said on Channel 4 News last week, it's going to have to be an individual effort, stroke a collective effort, stroke a human effort to try and get, you know, the problem solved. So, yeah, that's why I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Manuda. And uh, so that's, that sort of wraps up our, our introduction. So I'm going to hand over now um, to David Downing to facilitate the discussions based on um, the questions that have been received and uh, I look forward to that. So thank you, David. Okay, no problem. So just a reminder, if you've got a comment to make, you can put that in chat. But if you have got a question that you'd like put, 
then please put that in the Q&A. That would be really helpful. And if you can put those in um, as early as possible, that would be fantastic. Um, we're going to start by going in the deep end, really. And um, let's ask about the BCAA Climate Action Pledge uh, and ask maybe each of you could say whether you have signed it or haven't signed it. And if so, why you have signed it or why you haven't signed it. Um, that would be helpful for us to know. So let's change the order up a little bit. We'll keep rotating as we go through. So we started with Anna last time. So this time we'll start with Mark Hartley, if that's okay. So I'm really sorry. Could you just um, repeat the question? <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so it's about the BCAA Climate Action Pledge. And people can sign it, but they don't have to. Some have, some haven't. So if you have signed it, why have you signed it? If you haven't signed it, why haven't you signed it? Sorry, so I have signed it. Um, I, um, my understanding is that all green candidates have signed it or will sign it. Um, uh, some were late to uh, signing up, but we have a 100% commitment to that. Um, and as I've said before, um, the, the issue is, is that the climate needs to be uh, kind of right at the front of every decision making. And that's why it's important to sign up to these things and to make that commitment publicly. Um, it, it's, it's all well and good saying to the public, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you should be using the recycling bins and stuff like that, but we need to lead by example. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a very thing of pushing, pushing the, the blame onto the general public and saying that, you know, actually, if everyone did a little bit more, then we all would be in a better place. Well, actually, Bucks, Count, uh, Bucks Council needs to actually step up and we need to lead by, uh, by example and demonstrate uh, what we can be doing. And for me, candidates uh, signing up to that pledge is, is part of that um, and, and going forward into that. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go to Neil. So I had difficulty getting in the unmute there. Um, the problem we had, it, it somewhat contradicts the pledge that we made by Bucks Conservatives, and there are differences particularly around the date when we expect to meet certain targets. So that would contradict, so I haven't signed. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Mark, Mark Scholes. Hi, hello, yes. Um, yeah, I signed it when I heard about it, um, after reading it, I think it's pretty, it's pretty, makes common sense, um, moderate um, uh, pledges to make, really. I, I can't see anything, anything wrong with it. Uh, I think it is reasonable, it is, it is achievable as well. You can say much earlier than 25, you haven't set a date, but I mean, that's, that's fine. Um, we, we need, as a council, you need to, you need, it isn't just about, it is obviously about the individual as well, but the councils can, can help to make, like you say, set an advantage. Um, I, uh, yes, happy to make the pledge. I would always want to encourage it as well with people, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Fanula. Sorry, just to clarify the, the, the question. So are you talking individually or on behalf of the party? Uh, yes, you as individuals. That's how the questions come in. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, individually, no, I haven't, but I'm happy to do so. And I know lots of other Labour candidates across the country have signed it. So, yeah, I'm happy to do that. And Anna. Thank you. Um, yes, I have signed it. I believe all the other Lib Dem candidates have signed it as well. Um, I was very happy to do so. I feel like it's a grown up version of, like I say, the promise I've already made my daughter. Um, I particularly liked the part of it that said I promise to continue to inform myself because I think one of the biggest risks as a councillor is there's so much technology, there's so much changing all the time. <clears throat> the science is moving forwards. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think 
whilst we can make manifesto pledges now, we need to be aware that over the coming years, there will be changes. We will need to keep adapting and keep learning and keep looking for future ways forward to improve our, our net zero, um, how we're going to achieve the targets. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we've heard a couple of you there mention about dates and we've got to um, try to merge some questions here about dates uh, and when we want to get down to uh, a zero emission target. What date do you think that's feasible? And how do you think we can definitively get there? Have you got any evidence or proof of what your plans are that might, that might get you there? So let's uh, start with Neil this time. Let me just get rid of the, that's it. Okay. Well, as I said, the, the conservatives in Bucks have actually come up with a fully costed 60 point plan to take forwards. There are a number of things which are outside the direct control of the Buckinghamshire Council, uh, which can impact the rate at which we can achieve a net zero. Um, there are many things like heavy transport and technology providing a means of finding alternative power for these. Uh, coaches are coming through, we can see that, but some of the heavy transport, we're also looking to we, our current round of waste collection vehicles uh, have been modified now they're just in single collection to make them more efficient but we're looking for low carbon waste collection vehicles we are totally relying on the technology being made available to facilitate this so it's very difficult to set a firm date but what we can do is say that we are aiming by 2030 to have reduced the council's carbon emissions by 75%, and Boris is going for 78% by 2035. That is a pretty firm target. These are fully costed, fully tabled means of getting there. Thank you, Neil. So um, I hope we're all picking up what order we're doing this in, so it goes to Mark Spoils next. Okay, uh, I, I so it's it's not my area in terms of um, environmental uh, science, and I, I will be laying on it. But I will be relying on the officers in the council to help with, which I presume they've they've uh, that's the officers. It's the officers who have written the fifty points climate change, thing, which I've recently read again um, today. Um, the 50 points that they put in there are uh, are good. They look they look quite ambitious, actually. I, I am I am to be honest, I'm a bit skeptical though as to what what councillors have read it because there are things that the council are doing that go against it anyway um, at the moment. Um, so. Yes, yes, I would, I would be relying on uh, the environmental officers at the council to help with that, uh, with, with setting the targets, yeah. Okay, thank you, Mark. So, Fanula. I agree with Mark, to be honest, because I'm not a statistician, unfortunately. I mean, the first point of our, of our 12 point plan is that 2050 is the target, but obviously earlier is better. But how we get there is is a is a you know a long road to be honest. So I'm I'm not going to pull an arbitrary figure out of the air and say fine we'll do it in 2030, because you know as if the last year has proved anything, it's that we can't plan anything really. So yeah, I I think that's our bottom line really that you know 2050 is the deadline for which has been set but earlier is better 2030 would be best how we get there will take a lot of collaborative work between various people on the council to get there 
par Maxam. Anna. Thank you. Um, the Liberal Democrat manifesto includes the target of net zero 2030. Um, I have to say it's something I've also had experience of personally in my capacity as a board member at Bucks New Uni, where this was debated over a year ago by the full board. Um, the executive presented to us as board members the possibility of 2040 as an option. And I have to say I stood up and suggested we take 2030 as a target because I would far rather miss a target of 2030 by one year than to aim for 2040 or 2050 and find that half our country is flooded and half the wildlife in the world is dead. Um, so I think we need to be looking at all different aspects of the council business. So it's well documented that things like concrete for house building or space heating of our homes, electricity generation, all generate so much carbon that the planning department at the council need to have um, rules that encourage new home building to use more environmentally friendly materials. We need to have stronger policies about encouraging people to switch quickly to renewable sources for heating their homes. We need to make it easier for individuals to change, to change their own policy, except it's going to be very difficult for us to change freight shipping around the world, but we can lead by example. And I think we should be encouraging and supporting our local residents to try and make the changes that they need to make as individuals so that we can all meet this target together. And finally, Mark Harley. Uh, yes, I mean, I think uh, I'm gonna struggle not to be quite cynical about uh, the timing of today's um, announcement by the government because, um, you know, we have local election links coming up. We have Biden's climate summit. You know, I do feel that the, the, that the message from Boris today was timed for that. And I think we have to take those promises with a bit pinch of salt in many ways. Um, we have to do what is necessary, not what politicians think is possible. Um, I think that what's happened the last year is a prime example of exactly that. When we have to take action, we can take action, we can find the money and we can do something about it. The problem is, is we are run by a council that is under the, the whip of, of government. And we need to be in a council that can fight government on this and insist that 20, I mean, 2050 is just ridiculous. I mean, I will be, I think, 75 or 76. I mean, that is a failure on my part and a failure of our community if we think that that is a reasonable target. 15, uh, 30, 2030 is possible. Technology is, uh, if we invest in technology, uh, Neil mentioned about um, the fact that the technology is not there for vehicles. Well, that's not true, but if we, you know, I, I know it's not perfect, but that if we invest in some of this technology that is part way there, it encourages the, the, the involvement of technology faster and faster. We have to invest now in that technology. We have to do what is necessary, not what we think is possible. And I just feel that all around, we have just a lack of ambition and a lack of uh, uh, um, speed, uh, a speedily uh, uh, sense of uh, urgency to all of this. Thank you everyone for that. Let's move um, to a more personal level. And uh, here's a question about, have you assessed your own carbon footprint? And if you have, what actions have you taken to try and reduce it? So we're gonna start with Mark Scoyles on that one. Uh, yes, I did a couple of months ago from uh, with the uh, Marlow Energy Group. I'm a member of the Marlow Energy Group, and I uh, they they had a they had a link to it there. Um, I I live in a in a in a new apartment block, so it's quite I feel quite smug really. The, the, it's well very well insulated, and uh, it's a small apartment, so it's it was something like twenty five percent of the average in Marlow. Uh, but um, in terms of 
energy efficiency, I, I was, um, there's been, there was no TRVs and not a, a really horrible room thermostat. No, it wasn't a programmable one. So I, I'm, uh, I, I got uh, some TRVs fitted and some programmable thermostats to try and regulate temperature a bit more, help energy saving. Um, I think that's, that, that's the main, that is our main, that is our, as a family, as a household, that's our main uh, energy uh, usage, heating. And so, yeah, so I've cut back on, helped, helped cut back on that. Okay. Thank you. So, so let's go to Fanula. Even though you could assess your uh, carbon footprint. <laughs> um, for me, I mean, I live in a very well insulated little new build. Um, I don't put the heating on unless I need, I need it in the evening when I get in from work at about eight o'clock. Um, I take public transport everywhere. I don't know if that affects your, car your carbon footprint, but um, yeah, I walk to work. Um, I had to go to Aylesbury on Sunday, which was a four hour round trip to go not very far because I had to get a bus and a train. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think my carbon footprint is particularly high. But if anyone wants to challenge me on that, please feel free. Thank you. Anna. Thank you. Um, no, I haven't um, gone through one of the online assessments, um, but since doing Plastic Free July, not last year, but the year before, I have been constantly appraising my own uh, lifestyle and the choices that we make as a family to try and make sure that our footprint is as low as, well, it's never gonna be as low as it can be. We, we'll keep trying to drive it down, I think is the, the approach we're taking. So we do have an air source heat pump in our home. Um, we do drive an electric car. Uh, I pledge not to fly last year, but I think that doesn't really count. So I'll pledge not to fly this year instead. Um, or both years, which is even better. Um, and I'm working on things like trying to eat less meat um, and a lot of reusing and recycling, which um, comes quite easily to me. I, I don't like throwing things away. So um, yeah, I'm working on it, but I know we can all do better and we all need to keep striving. Mark. Cool, so um, I've, it's funny, I've been kind of watching lots of educational films, documentaries. I think we've all watched Plastic Planet when that came out and we all made a change in the way we use plastics or tried not to use plastics. Uh, then the sea spiracy kind of made me think about uh, eating fish on Netflix, worth watching. Um, I cut out eating beef uh, completely from my diet about a year and a half ago. Um, never felt healthier. I suggest it, everyone should do it, however much you like a, a, a medium rare steak. Um, it's much but healthier for you and um, it saves the planet. Um, cut down on milk. Be careful, of course, with uh, alternatives for milk, but uh, milk is terrible for our environment and it was a terrible um, sales pitch to us all in our childhood if you were around in the 80s that milk was actually good for us um, get rid of dairy products as much as you can i'm not saying i'm perfect i do love my cheese and my camembert and so does my son um, i don't have a car at the moment i would love to not have to buy a car i at the moment i can walk to work and i walk everywhere if i'm going to go for a big shop i share a car with someone else to be honest none of this is kind of me trying to be an eco warrior it's actually come out organically by just talking to people, understanding, being educated about it and finding that actually life can be cheaper and easier if you do make these changes. And they're not, they're quite easy changes to make, but people just need to know about them. And if they're not watching the documentaries and all that kind of stuff and uh, educating themselves, then I don't want, I'm not certainly don't want to preach to people, but part of the council should be about giving that information out and helping people to make the right decisions. So I would argue that um, I found my way through this by actually teenagers educating me, uh, certainly about dairy farming. Um, and I've learned this through obviously teaching science to GCSE students. And I would like the council to pay a little bit more attention on 
helping people to understand what the little changes they can do, which will actually also save them money, make, help them to be healthier, and also, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, help cut down their carbon footprint. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And let's conclude here with Neil. Well, thank you. Uh, great question, Dave. I've uh, been trying to get people to get into carbonfootprint.com is our recommended one. Um, we publicised that through the Marlovian. And yes, of course, I've done my own. And I've been reducing my emissions for years. Uh, if you want to know, when you do it, I um, household one is below 10. Uh, Dave, I think you've got the average uh, Marlow, you believe, around about 15. Uh, I have reduced, uh, I'm out in the sticks. We haven't got gas, but we've got oil fired heating, which you probably horrified at. I've reduced our household oil consumption over the years by two thirds. Uh, we've had solar thermal heating uh, on the house for over 35 years. I've just now replaced with PV panels. So I'm doing everything I can to get the carbon footprint down. Thank you. I'm also uh, an addict on repair and recycle. As, as uh, I, th I think it was Mark, was it? Uh, anyway, no, it wasn't. It was Anna. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't think we've bought a household white appliance view for 20 years of recycled. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you all for sharing a little bit about you. We're going to move it on to others now in Marlow. What actions do you see the council taking in fully engaging with the community to stimulate personal action and lifestyle change that's needed? And Fanula, you get to answer this one first. As someone who's relatively new to Marlow, I'm probably not the, the best person to answer this properly. Um, I haven't seen any evidence of that, if I'm completely honest. Um, I'm not a big advocate of, of the Big Brother, you know, mentality, though. So I'm not sure as councillors we should be telling people how to, how to behave. Um, I think you just need to put the evidence out there and give the information to the people and then they can, they can decide if, you know, how they want to um, try to respond, yeah. Anna. Thank you, David. Um, I think education has to be a mainstay of this type of um, encouraging people to change. Um, I was actually very pleased to see recently the town council campaign that they did with the Wombles um, to try and encourage children to draw posters um, about dropping litter and encouraging people to take their rubbish home with them. I think those kind of initiatives, when they spread through the community, can be really quite successful about getting people to think twice about what they're doing. Um, but I think there are some things that the council should be doing, leading by example. I think when we have gate fees at the tip, a it discourages people from taking all their waste and disposing of it properly. And I think um, there are some elements of the Lib Dem manifesto which would directly make it easier for people. For example, in some parts of Buckinghamshire, um, you still have to pay for green bin collections. And I just think that's wrong because actually every bit of green waste should be composted and should be disposed of properly. Um, so there are some financial decisions where I think the council just needs to say, we don't need that to have that extra tiny bit of money from um, green bin collections, and we should instead be, um, you know, diverting that money into encouraging people to act appropriately. Thank you, Anna. Mark Harley. So, I mean, I agree. We we can't 
no one should be preaching to other people and telling them how to, to, to how live their life. But I do find that most people, when they actually know the information and they're getting it from a reliable source rather than uh, the constant sort of social media kind of little bits of memes and stuff like that, that actually they will listen and they will take that information. Um, so I think education, like, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Anna said, um, to be honest, you know, those kind of methods of engaging with families, with engaging with children, um, with, I mean, I would just ask parents to actually listen to and engage conversations with what their, their kids are learning at school about all of this, because they, they learn it all. Um, and it's all in the curriculum, it's all in their GCSEs, it's all in their qualifications. I don't think we've done enough on electric uh, power supplies for cars. Sorry, I don't know the technical terms for them, but you know where you plug your electric car in. Um, certainly, I don't think we've done enough for the cyclists in our community. Um, I don't believe that we've created any new cycle pathways uh, in certainly in Marlow. I don't know of. I might I'll be sound corrected. I don't particularly feel that it's a wonderful thing to shout about for the current council to say we've created 16 new cycle loops in Marlow. I mean, that's a quite a not a huge number. Um, I think it's lovely to see one a water fountain being installed in Marlow, but I would love to see, you know, see a, a slightly more maybe in the next four years, um, because uh, ultimately that will encourage people to use um, their own water bottles when they're going on their run, rather than nipping into a store and buying a, a, a you know, a, a, a one use uh, plastic bottle. Um, I think we need to go a little bit beyond the single vinyl banner above, above the, the thing saying, this is a low carbon, low, uh, a low carbon, I can't even remember what the banner said. I mean, what does that mean? Uh, what does one banner do? Uh, we need to look a little bit more creative, a little more inventing, inventive, maybe use the arts, maybe use these wonderful organizations like Anna was saying, like the Wombles, like um, the, uh, there's some wonderful charities that recycle books um, and send them off to Sierra Leone. I mean, we should be engaging with all these uh, wonderful community groups um, and really empowering them um, to spread the message. But ultimately, um, you know, campaigns, that are slightly more creative and slightly more uh, a bigger breadth to them would be uh, very very beneficial in, press, uh, in in spreading the word. As I said, you know, we could even do things like uh, encouraging uh, in some way, you know, one day veggie day or whatever. You know, we've seen that nationally campaigns. Why can't we be get, getting it at grassroots? Why can't we be getting it at town council and county level? Thank you. Let's go to Neil. Great, thanks. Great question again. Um, as I said in the intro, I think educating the people, motivating the people in Marlow, we can achieve so much more. Uh, we've been communicating through the Marlowian, promoting through that, uh, trying to get people to look at their carbon footprints. Uh, we also ran Meg's, the Marlow Energy Group's uh, advert for IDDA uh, solar uh, PV panels. Uh, we had a program to run the education through the schools for, through Greater Marlow, but unfortunately that got delayed with the COVID and the schools are still a bit fully loaded. Uh, we still intend to run that, but we haven't yet got a time. Schools are still getting through their backlog trying to catch up on the education line. But as soon as they are, we're going to run that. And that is the other bit to get through to the parents, through the children, because the children can be great motivators. Uh, so, yep, education and what you can achieve through that is probably the biggest leverage that we have. Uh, cycling, we're doing our best. Uh, the water fountains, we've actually got three. We've got one uh, in Higgy Park. We got one on the causeway and uh, the church has put one by Coyton Square up, up by there. So 
Um, we started this initiative on the single-use plastics and water, bo water bottles to try and encourage that's really taken good hold. So we, have, we are doing our level best to try and get the people of Marlow to cut down on reusable plastics. Thank you, Neil. Let's go to the other mark. Thank you, uh, David. Um, could you just repeat the question? Sorry again. Just clarify what, what the question was originally. I'm, 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 I just wanted to. Sorry, you're on mute. Thank you. Yes, I've just got to find it now. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've deleted the question because I've asked it and I've moved on planning the next few. I think it was how, do, how you go about educating the, the, the community. That's right, about engaging with the community and about inspiring others in the area. I do apologise for that. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Uh, yeah, OK, well, so, yeah, as a council, we, we can't make laws. And, and I don't think, I say what other people have said, that you can't, people don't like being told what to do. They need to want to do something. Um, and again, I agree with other, other other people have said about education, the school, eco warrior uh, initiatives in schools have been really good. Um, we've been really, so lucky in Marlow with community groups, uh, the um, Marlow Bombles and others, and the town council has been good. I think in uh, in working with them, uh, I think uh, I could work much better uh, with them uh, and. The county council could work better with the, the new community groups that they've formed. We need more community involvement in those. Bottom up, at the moment, these community groups are top down driven from the council, from the county council cabinet. They need to be uh, reorganized, ground up kind of groups. Um, I, yeah, the, the county council needs to be need we need to be engaging people in a way that we need they need policies which uh, they give people realistic choices uh, for low carbon sustainable lifestyles um, we need to give people reasons to get out of their cars and or ways to get out of their cars realistic ways so we need we need segregated cycle paths active transport lanes need to be an integral part of the strategy for the county going forward. I'd, I'd love to see segregated lanes parallel to all our A roads going to Marlow, to Wickham, uh, Beaconsfield, Boob and Green, places like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's covered it all, I think. Okay. And for I think I already answered at the start, didn't I? Yes, you did. I'm, I apologise. I apologise. You did. Um, you put me on the spot like that. <laughs> uh, we've got lots of questions coming in. I'm trying to cluster them. But there's one question that I'm, I'm going to ask us not to speak to, but I would like you to put in the chat, please, uh, if you're a panellist. Um, what one thing do you think you're going to challenge yourself about regarding your footprint or your lifestyle regarding environmental concern for uh, maybe over the, over the next year. So you don't have to respond to that vocally. You don't have to put it in the chat straight away. I'll give you time to think about it. Um, but if, if you could put that in the chat as your response, uh, that might be a helpful way of, of doing that. Okay. We're going to move on now uh, to an area of finance. And there's several questions that are linked in here. So let's see uh, how we can get these questions to work. I'm going to try and cluster them. And there may be two or three questions here um, that flow together. And I think rather than asking you the three independent questions and then having the answers overlap, um, we'll see what, what overlay there may be. So the local precept for Marlow Town Parish is about 3% of overall Bucks council tax bills. Given that that is unchanged now for five years, whilst overall council tax has risen by 25%, 
is there a case for substantial increase to fund local, low carbon and other sustainable initiatives? So that's the first part of the question. So I'll give you the next part as well. So you've got time to process that and I'm happy to reread these. How will you leverage council procurement for climate action? Okay, so the first part is about the precept for Marlow Town Parish being around 3%. Uh, council tax has gone up by 25%. Is there a case for a substantial increase to fund local low carbon and other sustainable initiatives? And how will you leverage council procurement for climate action? Okay. So I'll give you just a moment. I can see one or two of you just making notes and uh, trying to find things. So don't forget everybody uh, who's a participant here. Uh, if you have got a question, you, you've still got time to put it in the Q&A. Um, I'm trying my best to try and put questions together that flow or maybe try and merge one or two questions. If also you've put a question there and you think I haven't quite covered that question sufficiently and it's a question that can go to all the panellists, uh, then please put that question again in the Q&A and I'll, I'll try and bring it in, in in a different way. Right, I think we're back to the start. So Anna, I think it's your chance to go first on this. Thank you. Um, I'm slightly confused by the first question because I don't think as a county councillor you have the right to set the precept for the parish council. Um, I do think potentially it would be worth the town council considering um, initiatives such as perhaps introducing uh, more funding for things like solar panels and things that could have a wider impact on the local community, but I don't think it would be our role as, as county councillors to address that directly. Um, on the procurement side for the overall county council though, I think that's a very interesting point because I think that's a really strong way in which the council can lead by example um, and I know people talk about these types of things being very difficult, but in my work at the university, I've seen the modern slavery statements that have to be made where the university has to guarantee that all of its procurement partners have to comply with modern state, modern slavery statements and, and certify that they are not um, dealing in, a, in modern slavery. So if we can do that, and that is already being done within large organizations within this area, why can't we have a similar set of rules and guidelines that relate to environmental commitments and hold people to account say we're not going to deal with you we're not going to purchase things from you unless you can guarantee that you are maintaining certain minimum standards mark hartley uh so yeah i don't sorry i, I apologize with my lack of understanding but i don't understand the first part of the question although i think it might have been but bordering on that, should we have an increase of council tax? Possibly, I don't know if that's really what the question is about, but, but obviously that's a very difficult question to ans answer. I would argue that, um, that uh, money can be found in different ways through collaboration with the, the people who are providing us services and with the businesses that we procure. And so th that kind of leads on to, I believe what the question is about the procurement of services. And I completely agree with uh, what, where Anna, Anna's coming from. At the end of the day, I'm trained as a COVID, I don't know, someone who basically works out COVID risk assessments for a, a business to open or a theater to open in my case. I have been trained to work out, you know, and, and ensure that people coming to me or wanting to buy my services or I'm wanting to buy those services, we work within regulations that will allow us to work safely. At the end of the day, we do this with diversity in the workplace. We do this with a whole host of things where we write into contracts, when we procure stuff, when we buy stuff, when we sell stuff, when we use services. And it seems rather sim simple if we have declared uh, a climate emergency, which we should be doing as a council, um, that we then write that into everything so that anyone working for us, anyone um, we employ to do a service has to show their green credentials and have to prove this. Now, it might that might be the case as that, that's happening. Um, it, obviously, Neil can correct me in this, but 
um, my argument is that they we need to only be working with businesses and we only need to be buying stuff that is leading to that zero net carbon and uh, it's as simple as that and possibly I don't uh, maybe Neil could answer this um the 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 purchase of new vehicles for the council that was mentioned in a meeting last night of actually being purchased that were diesel um and I I, I you know is that was that that consideration meant of procurement of that you know is that is is that way of ensuring that when we buy something it can be net net carbon neutral or at least heading that way over the next four years uh, leading obviously into the long term which is obviously net neutral by uh, 2030. Rather nicely let's go to Neil. Sorry, a bit slow getting the thing. Uh, it's quite a lot for me in this one. <laughs> um, first of all, the town precept. Uh, I think it's commendable that we've managed to nail it to only 3% over all these years. And it, that's really efficient running and not having waste, not generating waste and being very effective on our leverage and purchasing powers. And yeah, not having waste. The suggestion that we could increase it in order to fund something like solar PV panels, I think would be extremely inefficient in that you're just introducing a whole lot of administration. And how would you, you, you would be taxing all the individuals in Marlow, but how would you spread the benefit? Uh, I, I think you would add the cost overall with all the administration. It's much better just to encourage people to look at their own carbon footprint and where they can be most cost effective in how they reduce it. It's much easier that way. Um, as for County Council, it's uh, in procurement. What is best to do there is to look where the most cost effective solutions are, where your, you get your most carbon reduction per pound, where can you have the biggest increase on what's available in the technology at the moment. And I today had a conversation with uh, our cabinet member responsible for climate change in encouraging them to try and get more schools to get PV pumps. And it's very effective because the schools are occupied during the day, their power consumption is during the day. Uh, and therefore to have PV supply is, is a very cost effective solution. So it, it's, it's looking at where you can get the biggest bang for your bucks. That's the best policy, thank you. And let's go to Mark. Uh, so the, the the town council precept is only it's it's, it's only it's a pound pound a week or something is it so you could uh, yeah like doubling it doubling people's tax council tax bill uh, or fifty pound a week uh, fifty pound a year sorry fifty pound a year um, I, I it would depend on how proactive the, the town councils are and how much do they want to do they, and how if they um, as I say yeah as a county councillor we couldn't uh, as uh, as Anna said about we couldn't, wouldn't want to get uh, too di di direct, uh, directive about what they what they want to spend it on. But um, yeah, it would depend how proactive they are in terms of uh, initiatives. Um, I, I would certainly the town council be a bit more proactive with litter around the town. Um, I know funding for a uh, a street a street cleaner. Or something like that a sweet a road sweeper an electric road sweeper or something would be it would be uh good i think um obviously council attack cuts of, of we don't see those anymore i don't see street sweepers many more not not very often anyway uh few and far between so something uh something like that potentially i i'd imagine we good um in terms of council procurement yes um county council procurement uh 
new building yeah so the contracts could only be offered to people to, to suppliers who are um energy efficient supplying energy efficient products uh going forward retrofitting of government buildings and schools and things like that should be looking at only energy efficient products um what uh, transport wise so Again, transport is a big uh, emitter, so we want to look at the council's fleet of cars, fleet of vehicles, making for ultra low, ultra low vehicle, uh, ultra low vehicles, uh, ultra low emission vehicles. Sorry, um, <clears throat> and make sure, yeah, all suppliers, partners, and on oh, regulation as well. So town planning, uh, planning regulations, make sure we could uh, they could be upgraded. Uh, there's there's a lot about. Um, a lot of complaints in planning about making sure you've got car park spaces, but I, I'd like I'd like to see more emphasis on um, as well as as well as uh, electric charging points, um, more more about active transport space, space for for bikes, <laughs> um, cargo bikes, something like that uh, as well. More active transport. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mark. And Fanula, are you with us? I think we may have lost her. I just messaged her, but I'm not hearing a response back from her. Okay, uh, Mark, you've put your hand up. Did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I think one of the problems is that that we've been going down this rabbit hole saying what's cost effective and when we procure stuff I, I you know obviously I don't know every deal that the council has done in the recent four or five years but I just feel that we have this kind of a weight and necessity on looking at uh, what is affordable or what you know now but you know, yes, an electric car is more expensive but actually to run that electric car suddenly it becomes a lot lot cheaper and I just think we're kind of being quite narrow minded about what the bottom line is today. And unfortunately, one last thing, sorry to finish off, is just the fact that if, we, if we're not careful, we won't be able to afford anything in 10, 15, 20 years time. Um, you know, we have to invest, we have to pay money, we have to invest into our infrastructure right now, even if it costs us a little bit more, just like we have with COVID, to solve these problems now so they, uh, we don't, they don't come up and bite us and cost us even more in 15, 20 years time. Okay, thank you. Uh, well Neil, I think you want to say something. Can you hold on just a moment? Because I'm going to ask the next couple of questions so that you can cover what you wanted to cover. Um, this next question picks up on some things that have already been mentioned, but um, draws us into the next area of planning. So there's a question here of, should we construct PV solar farms on Greenbelt land? Now, I know some of you have started to ask, the, uh, yeah, ask some points about solar panels, but, it, but the question's more than just that. Um, and I'm also going to add in another question to that, which is what can be done via planning to ensure that all developments, including private ones, are challenged to improve the environment when there is any possibility of positive change as part of that development? So uh, a bit of a flow question there. So solar panels on Greenbelt land. And I say, I know one or two of you have already started to discuss that, but it, it, it's moving on from there. And where there are planning applications um, and planned developments, how can we challenge to get environmental improvement with those? So Neil, I'm gonna ask you to go first, because I think you had your hand up to cover something that was already under discussion. Oh, the, the other bit that I wanted to mention was there was an inquiry about uh, diesel vehicles from last night's programme. Unfortunately, as uh, we were in a, a group meeting uh, at county level, so I wasn't able to watch that and can't comment on it. Uh, in terms of, uh, sorry, what was your question, the second one? Sorry. There's the question about solar, 
So about solar panels on green belt. Green belt. And yes. then when there's development, how can we ensure that there's a positive impact for the environment and environmental concern? Okay, okay. Right. Uh, green belt and solar farms, it, it, it's, it's not too bad for green belt. It's really difficult in the OMB, areas of outstanding natural beauty, which are just outside Marlow. Uh, I do have a site in mind in Marlow, just to the north of Spinfield School. There was a, a site that we put uh, a limitation on that part of some farm ground that was split up and sold individual individual plots for uh, projected build uh, that. We put an art, a thing called an article four to prevent subdivision of the field. So that field is now under split ownership, but can no longer be used where well, they graze horses on it, but it can't be subdivided. Oh, it, and it, it, it has actually power cable uh, overhead transmission lines running through it. It'd be an ideal spot for a solar farm for Marlow but so difficult to achieve when it's such divided ownership and a lot of it overseas. But the principle is in Greenbelt, it's allowable, but it depends on the visibility of it. And unfortunately for us in Marlow and the Thames Valley, it's difficult to find a site that's not overlooked from the likes of say Winter Hill, uh, it's, it, it is quite tricky. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, as for uh, improvements, there are uh, things, uh, supplementary planning uh, advisories that are done in the planning stage that require certain levels of uh, performance on environment stuff that's already built in. New build has to meet very high standards. And uh, it's Getting the right level, uh, or one of the other things is when we're doing extensions, additional bedrooms and stuff like that, many houses now are required to put in uh, electric vehicle charging points. So particularly around the AQMA areas uh, where emissions are a problem, that's already built in. So that that is there and happening. Hope that helps. Thank you. So let's go to Mark Scoyles. Uh, I, I'm not aware of the solar panel development on, on Greenbelt or Amaro. Um, I can't really answer. I mean, yeah, I think you'd have problems with issues with uh, some of the parishes around Marlow with anything like that, to be honest. Uh, Bissum and Cookham and uh, Little Marlow. Oh, no, Little Marlow's here, aren't they? I don't know. Um, um, in terms of uh, solar panels over, over car, car parking might be an idea. I was, I was interested, saw, heard an interested idea. Solar panels for over the public car parks. Um, if I could. Um, I think the council should be, again, looking at the planning organisations, the um, looking at Charging points for new housing for electric cars again should should be made a priority, I guess. Um, the one one local plan, which was the the new rowing club down at the the new boating lake, an example there was there was that the the, uh, the officers were talking about car charging points there, uh, not mentioning um, bike parking, bike racks. I just think that again, there's something forgotten about there. Um, I'd like to see a bit more about about uh, emphasis on bicycle racks. I'm not I'm not really obsessed about bicycles, honestly. But I don't want to keep sound might sound like it. Um, yes, I think. Sorry, I hope that's answered it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Fanula, did you hear the question? No, oh, sorry, my internet cut out there, so I didn't that's hear okay. the question. So, <laughs> okay, so the question is, um, it's about 
is it should we be installing solar panels on Greenbelt? So we've had a little bit of a discussion in the previous set of questions about the value of solar panels, but it's moving into that value and also about the about the issue of Greenbelt. And where there are developments, whether they be private or otherwise, how do we encourage there to be benefit uh, for the environment and understanding for environmental concerns? First part of the question is that, well, there's no, there's no legal objection to, you can put solar panels on green belts. Um, a lot of green belts are own, is our agricultural land. I suppose we have to kind of appreciate that a lot of people have, a lot of farmers especially have had a hard time over the past year, year and a half, they might need that extra income. So we have to be sympathetic to that. It just can't be about the aesthetic process of it, if you understand what I mean, you know, just because it doesn't look particularly nice, you know, at the end of the day, it's our land. And if they do it legally, why shouldn't they? Why shouldn't they put it on it? To be honest, can you just go the other sec the second question again? I don't really think I understood that one. Yeah, so where there's developments that are being planned in the in the area, how do we make sure that there's, that, there's, that, that there's environmental benefit there and at least understanding of environmental concern? Well, that's a that's a dialogue. Well, as a solicitor, that, that was a dialogue that I would have with with a developer, and you know, with you know, people who are involved in the development. I think it's a bit of a mute point, really. Okay, thank you. Anna. Thank you, David. Um, I've heard varying things about solar panels on Greenbelt, and I know there are farmers in the area around Marlow who have already been approached by um, companies wanting to put solar panels on their fields. My personal view is that roofs would be a much better place for solar panels than green fields, um, both from an aesthetic point of view and a wildlife point of view. Um, solar for schools has already been mentioned by Neil, I think, and um, that's something that I'm working at Holy Trinity, where I'm a governor at Holy Trinity School in Marlow, to try and get solar panels put onto the roof there, because I do think these types of buildings, particularly, as you say, ones that are used during the day, are a much better place to putting solar panels than um, green fields, which have a, a value for well-being, for wildlife, and um, something that we all appreciate. In terms of planned developments, um, I'm not a planning expert, but my understanding is that when something goes into uh, request planning, that the council has the power to review uh, whether they grant planning permission for developments and they have the ability to influence the controls and the um, rules against which the planning is being assessed. So I don't see why in the longer term we can't incorporate environmental um, requests, you know, environmental goals into the set of criteria that we are assessing planning permission against um, to incorporate things like how the property will be heated, what kinds of materials it's built from, how efficient it's going to be, how well insulated it would be. I think charge points and bike racks um, are probably small fry in comparison to looking at construction materials and the overall energy usage of the property in the longer term. So that would be my goal. Thank you, Anna. And finally for this question, Mark. Uh, thank you. Um, every time I drive down the M4, I think it is towards my parents, um, I absolutely have a smile on my face when I see the acres and acres of lands of solar panels that I drive past. Um, not only because um, I know I won't get hay fever because it's not covered in rapeseed, but also because it's, you know, it's energy, free energy. Um, you know, someone actually asked in the in the um, in the chat about whether our credentials on choosing banks and stuff like that. I have a green bank that is on renewables. I have my electricity provider that is 
only using renewables and that's what we should be using. And I think we need to see the beauty in solar panels and we need to see the beauty in, um, in uh, the wind farms that are in Cornwall. I, I look at them and I go, that's beautiful because I'd much rather that, that something that actually isn't damaging the environment um, then and that also when technology improves can be deconstructed taken down and instead of 10 wind farms or hundreds and thousands of solar panels we can reduce it when technology improves um, at the end of the day we need to move away from fossil fuels that obviously is polluting our our, our world we need to close um you know our nuclear option is not nuclear power is not the option because it will pollute our um, our country for for millions of years so it is the way forward and I agree with everyone who this is talking about you know maybe roofs are better but actually for the short term what we, we have to take action we have to do action in a large way and unfortunately shoving eight panels on one roof here six on there whatever won't so I don't feel um, and maybe I'm talking uh, I'm talking personally I don't feel that that's the way that we will solve this problem quickly. We will need to have to look at uh, greenfield sites, but when they are constructed, we just need to make sure that our wildlife is safe. We need to look at the impact on that because we will be hopefully, because you will have invent, uh, voted us all in to ensure that we are in a climate emergency. So when that solar panel uh, farm is built, that it is uh, tested against rigorous conditions to make sure it doesn't have an impact on the environment. But we do need to look at that because if we are going to turn all our cars electric we will need to produce more electricity and we will need that electricity to be green as far as planning applications are concerned well this is a prime way of making sure we have solar panels on the top of roofs because we can tighten up the planning applications we can make sure that there is in more uh, 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 more insistent that those environmental factors of the building itself conserving energy but also creating its own energy that it will pump back into the grid is it's a perfect opportunity now i'm not a lawyer so i'm assuming that if a planning permission has been signed off by the council we can't obviously alter that which i'm not sure if that, the question was asking that but certainly future planning applications again we will be in a climate i'm i'm going to say it out loud we will be in a climate emergency so we will the council will be putting in extra conditions on planning applications and we developers will do it developers if they want to build a, a set of flats and make some money they will put some car charges in there they will put solar panels on the the roof to to, to power them, they will make sure that the combi heater, boiler, whatever is the most efficient if we say it has to be. And we have, uh, my understanding is the council has the power to say that uh, through planning and that we should have that right and we should drive this forward. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so our next question comes to uh, the area of carbon offsetting. And I wonder if you could say a few words about how carbon offsetting plays a role in your policies. So we started with Neil last time, so we'll go to Mark Scoyles now. Okay, so as, a, as an independent, as I said, I don't have any, any policies as such, so I wouldn't be able to... Uh, answer that in the terms of a policy question. Uh, as I say, as an independent, I would be looking to scrutinise whoever's running the council, um, what they're doing. Um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't I say I don't have a policy for carbon offsetting for, in terms of council, in terms of what the council are going to do. Uh, yeah, so okay. I'll answer that. I think we've lost Fanula again. So, Anna, we'll come to you if that's okay at this stage. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think the only relevant policy that the Lib Dems have got at the moment is our plan to plant 150,000 trees each year. So, I know the Conservatives have picked a big target number, but the Liberal Democrat approach is that we would like to see an increase in tree cover extending out into the future and that we can keep. Um, planting those trees and using those as a form of carbon offset. 
I obviously, as we mentioned earlier about um, technology advancing and how we need to keep informed and keep ourselves updated, I would assume that in the longer term, we'd be keeping ourselves abreast of developing technology to find other options um, to cover this possibility. Thank you. Mark. I'm sorry. Um, dare I say, I think that sometimes carbon um, offsetting is used as a way to um, cover up the cracks of not solving the principal problem. Um, you know, I think that companies can make an excuse of, oh, yeah, well, we're building or we're putting money into building a forest over there and here and whatever. But actually what they, you know, the, it's, it's not it's not the, the answer uh, primarily. You know, we should. Yes, obviously, I understand that certain things will give out carbon um, until technology catches up and allows us to. Um, unfortunately, we don't have electric airplanes at the moment. And unfortunately, we will have to have air travel of some degree, hopefully a lot less but we will have some air travel at some, you know, uh, coming back in out of the pandemic. Um, but I think, uh, so I think offsetting is, is gonna be here to stay, but I don't think it's gonna solve all the problems. Um, I do think that companies um, need to just actually look at the, bare, the, the basics and actually look at how people are getting to their work, um, how, whether they need to come into work now with, the, with all that's happened with the pandemic and the fact that people can work at home. And I think a lot of offices are looking, like, looking at that and a lot of companies are, are looking at that. But uh, as far as I'm concerned and as far as I, I believe the Green Party is concerned is that we are very wary about saying that, um, that carbon offsetting is the way forward. We need to actually be looking at cutting down the amount of carbon everything uses in every fundamental bit that we are, are making or are doing, um, including our own food. And one thing I didn't say about solar panels was, of course, you know, we might need to be producing more of our own food, uh, um, you know, moving forward. So, of course, there has to be a balance to it between the fact that we've had a lot, an awful lot uh, in recent years of um, farmland that's not been basically being used, but actually we might need to be growing more vegetables on that, especially if we're all going to have at least one day or two days a week being vegetarians. Thank you. Neil. I would be very cautious on carbon capturing because often it's an opportunity to give yourself a clean conscience rather than actually doing something about your carbon footprint yourselves. Um, carbonfootprint.com do offer offsetting and I would be very cautious about using it. There's a difference between offsetting and carbon capture. Planting trees is carbon capture and that is a positive move. Offsetting, you don't know where it's going and how it's being administered and what it achieves. I, I would not I'd be very, very cautious about using offsetting. Thank you. So Fanula, are you okay to answer a question about how important carbon offsetting is to you and your policies? Yes, apologies. I keep getting cut off. <laughs> um, yeah, that's fine. Um, well, as part of our 12-point plan, 10 is, I think, probably similar to Lib Dems, where we do have a, a goal for planting trees, etc. Uh, point two is to try and encourage more people to take local transport. However, that's, as I explained earlier, you know, that's quite difficult tomorrow because there isn't very much of it. So it would be trying to, you know, motivate people maybe to walk more, not drive into town as much, etc. I mean, I mean, these are all kind of lifestyle changes that it's, it's kind of, it's going to go with the heart and the head, isn't really, if, if you know, People need to get their kids to school quickly. They're going to want to jump in the car. They're not really going to want to work, uh, walk, or you know, get a bus. You know, when the buses are quite minimal. And also, if you're going out for the day, you know, do you really want to pay? If you have your family, you know, do you really want to pay maybe sixteen pounds on the bus when you could probably drive somewhere cheaper? You know, these are all things we need to think about. Yeah, I think public transport in Morlo is a definite issue. A definite issue. Okay, uh, let's have a, a, a fairly quick fire round, I think. Uh, just in a few words, could you answer this question? Do you have a policy on enabling cross-party working on climate change and environmental concern? And I think uh, we're a little bit out of an order with 
with Fanula coming in and out. So Fanula, I think it's your turn to start though, if that's all right. Well, I think, as I said at the start, I think this is something that needs a collective approach. I think mm. party lines don't really come into this. So, you know, I think it needs a collective approach for us all to work together if we get elected. And that's all I have to say on that really. I don't have any problem working with anybody and I think everyone's more united and as this evening has proved we all have more in common than divide us really on this issue. Anna. Um, yes I don't have any awareness of a specific policy in the Lib Dem manifesto but I think the Lib Dems have always taken the approach that they will be happy to work with whoever is around and whoever um, they can come to agreements with because this is so far beyond party politics that I I can't even contemplate trying to do this along party lines. It has to be everybody joined up together and everybody taking everything, every aspect of our lives and every aspect of policy um, as a compromise together. And um, Mark Harley. Uh, yeah, well, I, my personal thing is the feeling is that the Greens and why I, I joined them is the Greens are very well known for working across party lines. Uh, Caroline Lucas is an, a perfect example of that. Um, you know, ultimately, um, my real passion for this election and elections going for, further forward for Bucks is just to have more um, voices for more of the community of, of, of Marlow, but also the whole Buckinghamshire um, and a more representation from different parties. Because I do believe that when you are not making decisions down party lines and you are actually battling it out, I, I mean, you know, I think a, a good sensible discussion, just like we have in classrooms with kids is really healthy to get actually the right right answer to the questions and not just um, have that uh, one party uh, making that decision uh, down party lines. Thank you. Uh, Neil. Thank you. Uh, I think it's easy, probably easier to look at it from the Marlow perspective because we on the town council have been engaged with the Marlow Climate Alliance Network. We have been actively working with them and talking with the various different groups, but they're not political groups per se, but just different environmental groups within Marlow. Um, and that is, is quite, uh, we can be quite outspoken at times. Uh, we air our differences and we have good debate. And it's also cross-supporting on many things. Uh, we haven't had, I don't believe we have a policy uh, for the Conservatives on cross party, but you know, where, where there are members that are elected, we engage at the uh, county level. Thank you. And let's go to Mark. I think uh, there was a difficult one for Neil to answer because there aren't many opposition people for him to do, for the Conservatives to uh, engage with. But um, on county level, uh, well, on town as well. But uh, yes, no, I, as, as an independent, again, I'd be, I'd be looking to uh, cooperate and collaborate with anyone that wants to, uh, that wants to build a better Marlow and build a, a better future for, for my children and, and my, uh, my children's generation. Um, I'll be looking to collaborate with uh, everyone. Uh, there needs to be less political posturing at uh, Aylesbury at County Hall. There's, there's a lot of that from all, all, the, uh, all the main parties there at the moment. Um, and climate change is something, again, it's climate change is something that's and that's not just a bucks thing. I think it's all over. There's, it's, it becomes a, a secondary issue, uh, which is wrong. Which is wrong. Um, so yeah, hopefully going forward, it will become more of a a more primary issue for councillors to debate with and work together with. Yeah, healthy debate and challenge is is needed. But but yeah, definitely. All, 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 all for, we want collaboration, fact based collaboration. 
Thank you. Okay, so we're going to wrap up the questions fairly soon, which I'm sure all, all the panellists will be delighted to hear. Uh, but don't forget, panellists, if you haven't put in the chat what the one thing is that you're going to commit to over the next year, um, then you've got just a few more minutes to do that. And then just to explain, we're going to do uh, just about one, one last question. And then once we've had the answers for that, um, each of the panellists will be asked to give a little summary and Dan's going to lead us in that section. So the final question really for this part is, what does climate and ecological emergency mean to you? And how would this inspire you once elected? What does climate and ecological emergency mean to you? And how will this inspire you once elected? So I'll give you just a few moments on that. Um, and I'll say if you haven't, uh, once we're going through the end, again, for the panelists, just to uh, get, their, get their comments in the chat about that. And thank you to everybody who's asked questions. Um, I know we haven't been able to quite cover them all. Uh, there's one or two others that there that we haven't had chance to get to, but I want to give a chance for the panellists to give their wrap up, um, especially bearing in mind some of the questions that have been asked. So uh, I'm really quite confused as to where we've got to, but I, I can't think we've been unfair. I think all of you have started a round of questions um, at least two or three times. We've had so many questions. So I think we'll go back to the start and, and start with Anna, if that's OK, and then we'll go through the normal list. So, Anna, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the climate crisis or emergency means to me the importance of acting now. I think it's really disappointing that there hasn't been a declaration of climate crisis from the council. And I think whilst we're talking about targets and how far out into the future um, we can expect to get things done, I think the key issue for me is that we need to start making changes now. You know, we should have made them yesterday, we should have made them the day before that, but now that we are accepting these things, we have to start making changes now in every area that we are able to. Um, because I think we all know deep down that the types of things we're talking about, it's still going to be a real struggle to get to net zero. Um, and we've, there are some elements that the, the scientific reports show that we're going to need future technologies to deal with issues like air travel or shipping and things like that. So we need to start changing the things we can fix immediately. Mark Hartley. Hi, so um, for me, climate change, climate emergency is, is, the, is the world. Um, if we don't do our bit or we don't lead the way, um, then, then, you know, ultimately for me, climate emergency is the whole world. Uh, I, think, I think the question was kind of asking our understanding about the two difference about climate and ecological. Um, the thing is about that is that obviously it's very easy for us in Marlow where we have a beautiful place to live. I'm very, very blessed to live in Marlow and I will, I'm very happy, proud to say that very lucky and fortunate to live in such a lovely area. And it would be very easy for our community to just go, well, what, what's the point of us trying to do, reduce our emissions because, you know, China and other undeveloped countries aren't, are, are increasing while they're increasing. But, but we have, we are, our success, our financial security in our country has, is off the back of the industrial revolution. And we put, started putting that, those, that carbon into the environment. And so we have to lead the way out of it. And that is the really crucial difference why we must be a leader, our country must be a leader. I am very pleased that Boris has made the announcement he has done, um, but I want to see action and I want to see action from Bucks County. And I believe that the only action we can get is by ha having more representatives from different parties on, on that arguing this case and pushing this agenda. As far as e ecological, my understanding about the science, maybe I might be a little bit uh, 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 wrong is that it, that is more about the ecological cycle within certain environments and so for me my understanding of that is is about our, our really taking care of what we have in Marlow so that is our woods that is our lovely fields that is our waterways making sure that Thames water isn't polluting it yet again like they have been uh, that we are 
really considering planning um, permissions for, although it's wonderful social housing, but should we be building social housing on flooded fl floodland? You know, is that going to have any ecological effect? Um, you know, so for me, the ecological argument is, is closer to home and as just as important because it does feed in to the wider problem. The only problem is, is the ecological problem is actually being um, put under more pressure because of climate change, because we're having more flooding, we're having more extreme weather. And so the ecological way that our animals, our birds, our nature, all around our insects, our bees that are so crucial to pollinate and for us to have food to eat are being damaged because of climate change. So that's why we have to call a climate emergency so that we can sort out the ecological disasters that are also happening very close at home. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Uh, I think from what I've said, I, I, my personal commitment to carbon reduction is genuine and meaningful. But I don't believe in promising to deliver what you can't deliver. I think it's important that we are realistic and what we are doing is achievable and, and, and manageable. But that's not to say it's not important. I do believe in leading by example, and I do believe that educating and encouraging the community in Marlow is a very, very important factor in that. And I'm pleased to see Boris's announcement today. And I think that is putting an encouragement, putting a marker up for this forthcoming conference, the climate conference that's coming up in Scotland. My concern, if you like, is we the impact. We, we could go, if we went carbon neutral by 2030, it would make deadly squat difference on the world atmosphere. That is my sincere meaning concern. We really have to change world climate change. And the way I, th I think we've got to be conscious of our purchasing anything that we purchase from China, from India, from the US of A has a carbon footprint. And that is the leverage we've got in terms of trying to get those major producers to change. Not an easy challenge, but that's one that we have to carry through. How we do it is difficult, but that, that's where we've got to go, in my opinion. Thank you. Mark. Uh, so, yeah, locally, or in terms of individual impact, it's trying to reduce uh, fossil fuel usage, um, so trying to think of low carbon alternatives. Um, as, as a council, we, we're trying to enable uh, low carbon alternatives, realistic choices that make, make it easy for people to use low carbon alternatives um, in terms of the policies that, they, that the council has. Uh, protecting protecting the wildlife again. Uh, yeah, the uh, it's a beautiful place to live, Marlo. I'd like to protect more of the wildlife. I'd like to see more wildflower uh, verges and embankments and things. Um, bees, insects. Uh, globally, yes, it, it is. It's not an easy thing, but uh, yeah, I'm glad. Hopefully, that we are going to become a lead. We we have. We'll wait to see if we if there is action there. Um, I'd like to see us, yes, become global leaders. I, I, I hate, I hate the uh, the Nigel Farage argument that, uh, that just that we only produce one percent of the the world emissions, and China produces so much more. So, you know, we shouldn't do it. It's not, um, you know, don't let the, <laughs> letting the letting the dog shit on your lawn because next door's lawn is so much worse is is not a good argument. Uh, can't do that. Um, Yes, that's my answer, thank you. 
Thank you. And Fanula. Thanks. I think I'll just go back to what I said earlier, actually, which is um, I'll just to probably resonates with what Mark just said. You know, it's it's kind of you have to educate people individually, well, individually, and I hate saying educated because that sounds really patronizing. So it has to start individually. So do it that way. And then it becomes collectively and then it becomes a community. I mean, I wouldn't go too big and say we have this is what we're, you know, let's talk about China and the US, etc. You know, if you can encourage one person to walk their kids to school as opposed to hop in the car for a 10 minute journey. I mean, that's just a simple thing that I think is is well done. And um I moved from Reading before Christmas and I, I you know in Reading it was everything was so accessible by public transport. You know, Mark Broder had done such a great job, our MP of you know really pushing on the buses and you know you could get anywhere in Reading on a bus. You know, that's just not possible here. And I think that is really one of the keys if we can kind of get our public transport up to scratch. But um, I suppose that's going to have to come from the council, really. And as I said earlier, a lot of families probably wouldn't want to take the kids out for an afternoon if it's going to cost more than hopping in the car to go to the park. So, yeah. Hope that answered the question. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to hand back over to Dan now. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, David. Thanks, everyone, for all your answers and for everyone for um, so many questions. I feel like we could we could carry on for some time. And uh, yeah, there's certainly enough uh, enough depth of conversation there to go on, go on for a while. Um, what I'd like to do is just invite um, all the candidates to make um, a, a sort of a closing um, statement. David, is that, does that sound OK based without a specific question, just a general closing statement? So this is very much um, whether you want to directly respond to anything. Um, we'll, we'll try and keep them to um, between one and two minutes each. Uh, a closing statement. Um, and again, we'll go in, a, in, a, in a, a random order, different to how we started. So um, we'll start off, please, with Neil. Well, thank you. Difficult to engage with Brayden quickly, but uh, no, my commitment will be in this forthcoming year of getting elected is really getting close to the cabinet member that has a, that responsibility and trying to give a steer to try and improve or get these solar panels on schools, for example, on, on the pub, public buildings. That is the most immediate short-term gain that I think we can make at a county level. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, thanks, Neil. And uh, next, if we could have Mark Scholes. I would hope that uh, it is going to be a Conservative majority at the next council. Um, so I, I, I want to be able to work with them, uh, like uh, Neil says, influence their the cabinet to um, uh, to adopt a more I, 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 I'm, I'm a bit worried, I think, as, as, a, as most of the uh, panellists are, I think, about this uh, saying, say it's the, the fact that they, I thought it was cheeky really to say, it's, they've set an ambitious target of 2050. And it's, it's not an, um, 2050 is not an ambitious target. It, it's, it's a conservative target. Uh, it's not ambitious. If you said 2030, that's ambitious. I think that's, core of what people are worried about, whether the Conservatives are going to be serious um, about this target, It'd be a bit more action to back up their words. I, um, the, the, the development at the Crest Roundabout now, at the, uh, by, by next, they're, they're changing the roundabout into a, changing the roundabout into a, uh, a junction, a three-way uh, traffic light junction. They're using um, they're using planning that's from the 1990s. It's not using, it's not encouraging active transport. 
it's not using best techniques, best international best practices. Uh, it's they're using yeah, it's it's using thirty year old uh, designs, not modern designs. It's not in, it's not encouraging sustainable transport. It's just very car centric, and it's thirty years behind the time. So the conservatives really need to up the game, I think. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Mark. And uh, on to um, Anna, please, next. Thank you. I think my overall position is summarized in the fact that we need to start acting now. and We need to change what we can change in all areas. I feel we need a step change in decision making um, at the Bucks Council level. And I think that the Lib Dem plan to have a council level position pushing forward environmental issues and really working towards a goal of net zero by 2030 is really significant and a very good idea. We haven't even touched on the fact today really that we have um, illegal levels of air pollution within central Marlow and the town has been an AQMA, uh, an area of uh, quality management for many years, which is also deeply concerning. And um, the Lib Dem policy is that we would be looking to introduce low carbon emission zones within um, the low emission zones within the centre of Marlow and, and cities like that, because I think um, those types of illegal pollution levels are simply unacceptable. So overall, my feeling is that the council should be inspirational and showing leadership by example and we need people who are looking forwards to lead um we need to work together that's undeniable um i would be very happy to work with anyone here on progressing towards net zero um but i think we all need to take it seriously and i would hope that the council whoever is elected to council will be somebody that will be pushing forwards towards the goals that we really need to achieve Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Anna. And uh, Fanula, please. Yeah, just to say thank you, David and Dan, for hosting tonight. I actually find it really kind of positive and that, you know, there seems to be much more here that unites everybody than kind of divides us. And I just think, you know, that's really uplifting that, um, you know, whoever is elected and gets in, that we can all work work together, basically, to, um, you know, to kind of push this forward. Um, as I said, I, you know, we do have a 12-point plan. Most of it revolves around trying to encourage public transport, as I think I've added on quite a lot tonight about. Um, so, yeah, it'd be good to push that forward and, yeah. But I, yeah, it is quite, you know, reassuring that everybody seems to be on the same page. Okay, thank you very much. It's nice to meet you all. Thanks, Manola. And uh, on to Mark Hartley, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dan and David, for hosting tonight. And also thank you, Mark, Anna, Neil and Manola for um, being great sparring partners. Um, I've gone through the whole mass amount of emotions in the last 10 minutes from Neil last speaking and I apologize for singling you out but um you kind of said something that's that needs we need to change we need to not have we need to have ambition we need to have passion to make a real change much much quicker we have an we it's a necessity for us to do this not and that and you know the if we've learned anything from the last 12 months, um, our communities can do it. If they are given the right information, if it's explained to them, um, if they see what the damage we're doing and how we can make a difference, then people will change how they, they live and how they operate. Uh, they will wear masks if they need to, they will um, not go and see family. I mean, They've, they've given up so much for the last 12 months. The problem with climate change is that it's a slow trickle thing. We don't see it happening very quickly. It's very, very slow, but if you, you know, uh, but thankfully lots of lovely documentaries are out there. And I just 
hope that you all go out and watch uh, Supremacy, Plastic Planet, uh, all the Attenborough, please listen to these people and they will demonstrate the damage that we are doing right now and we, can, we need to do it. Um, obviously, um, coming out of the pandemic, we, we are looking to, to, to form a new normal. You know, we can't, we, life won't return completely as it was. Um, and I would say neither should it, but all I'm asking for the voters is to consider that we need to have a new greener normal. Um, and this is a perfect opportunity to lay the found, foundations for us to come out of this pandemic and actually make lasting change that, will, that is ambitious. And my last thing would be to say is just a bit of a, a plug for the Green Party, because I'm here to represent the Green Party. But you know, we are the third largest party in the popular, popular kind of uh, thing out there. People do actually like our, our wonderful social policies and our green policies. We are what, what it says on the tin, as they say. Um, the hesitation in general elections is that, well, you know, we, we just want to get that person out, so we need to vote for the second person. But the thing is about local elections, you get three votes. And I just ask, whether it's Green or whether it's anybody else who's spoken at the truth here and really made you passionate about politics, go out, tell people about what this, this has happened, hopefully share the clips of this discussion that I, I think will be available. And please tell people to vote for change. You've got three votes and you can make a huge difference. And small independents, Green parties, Liberal Democrats, everyone can actually paint the, the council a very different color uh, come 6th of May. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, so thank you everyone. And uh, thanks once again for everyone who joined us tonight. Just as a sort of, I guess, a, a sort of summary closing statement from my perspective, I think, I think it, it's, I think it's really important that we're guided by science. And I think um, I would urge any, anyone out there who's the power of a vote to, to understand the, uh, the gravity of this issue um, for the sake of our generation, actually, and let alone for our, our, our next generation. And use that science to, to guide you in, in terms of who, who you the answers you're hearing and, and who, you, who you feel is, is most consistent with that science. Because there's a lot out there, there's so much information, we've all got access to it and we owe it, we really do owe it. As, this, is the, this is the biggest issue of our time and I think we owe it to, to understand that science. A couple of snippets that I think are really, really powerful. Um, you know, we know that we're, we're, you know, one and a half degrees is the, is the number that we're, that we're really, and as I said, um, it's it's not about a sort of an aiming point. This is this is this is a figure that really does mean something. This is a figure that really does have huge implications for the habitability of our planet. So as it stands right now, between now and 2030, it's a 7.6 reduction every year between now and 2030 to achieve what we need to achieve um, to maintain to to to, to have a, a chance of staying within that that area. If we delay that by five years, that becomes a 15 and a half percent reduction to achieve that target by 2030. So these, these numbers, sometimes when you start to think about um, the, you know, the, the, the impact um, of, of delaying action. So I think it's great that we've had the chance to ask questions and, and hear responses um, and, and you know, basing our decisions, our, our votes on the science, and what we've heard. Um, and I'm just really grateful that we've had the chance. So thank you once again for everyone um, that, that joined us. Um, and for asking the great questions, the candidates for, for your answers and for, for your engagement. Um, as I said, and it's on behalf of, of the Marlowe Climate Action Network that we're able to do this, this tonight. Thank you very much to David for facilitating and um, wish you all a very good night. Thank you. <laughs>